Yeah, Dr. Dre is in full effect, and I gotta tell y'all a little something. Easy E is down with us. MC Ring, you know he's down with us. DJ Yella is down with us. Arabian Prince, you know he's down with us. Tony A the Wizard is down with us. JJ Fag is down with us. Timmy T, you know he's down with us. DJ Poo Boy is down with us. Toddy D and Spade, they're down with us. My boy Ice Cube, you know he's down with us. I like to mention, so pay attention to where I'm from. Compton, but the tapes are from the rodeo. My name is Dre, listen while I play. And by the way, I'm also down with NWA. Yo, Steve at the rodeo is down with us. Slang and funky tapes, it is a must. We're number one. Yo, welcome everybody to Wednesday, episode 16 on Rodium Radio, and I got a special friend today, but before we get to that, once again, I got to promote the Rodium Mixtape Documentary, and what I'm about to say is probably going to shock a lot of you, but I will put this up against any West Coast documentary right now. That's how good this is, okay? Um, what you pay for unlimited streaming will be well worth your money. It's about three hours long, and uh, many people say, well, I don't have time to uh, watch a three-hour documentary. Let me tell you something. There's people that have said, I wish it was longer. So um, you could take that to the bank. But I would put this up against any West Coast documentary, um, the Rodeo Mixtape documentary, based on the life of Steve Yano, the swamp meat vendor from the city of Whittier. Uh, once again, for those people that have ordered the shirts and have yet not received their order, um, you should have them this week, if not already. Uh, but due to the holidays and due to the uh, build, um, us moving to a different location is the reason why we are a little bit behind. But without further ado, I want to introduce my good friend, Brother Arab, formerly from the group NWA. Thank you for coming, my brother. Yes, sir. Truly a, truly a pleasure and an honor to have you here, you know, to be able to interview people that I grew up listening to uh, uh, you know, to me, it's, it's just an um, it's just an excitement. It's just something that I I, um, I guess it's like a dream come true, and I'm being honest with you when I say that. So, but before we get into why your name is Arabian Prince, why you left NWA, and what are you doing now, I usually like to backtrack, almost kind of like where we spin a record backwards and start it from the very beginning. Uh, wh where were you raised at? Compton. City of Compton. Now, uh, uh, did you ever move back and forth, or were you just raised there from the... So, I was born and raised in Compton, and I was there till I was probably about, man, maybe seven or eight. Uh-huh. And then I remember moving... No, maybe a little longer, till about maybe 10, because then I moved to Inglewood. They moved us... My mom's like, we, we got to get out of Compton. It's too crazy over here. <laughs> got to Inglewood. It wasn't no better. Right. So, moved to Inglewood, and then I, you know, went to... Went to uh, later elementary school and then high school that way on that side of town okay well what, what elementary school did you go to so it's so funny dude like growing up in compton we we moved a lot inside of compton i lived on the i guess you would call it the west side of compton and the east side of compton you know on the greenleaf side the willow side i was all over so i went to st albert's st lawrence our lady of victory my mom's kept me in catholic school and then uh, when I moved over to Inglewood, I ended up going to St. Michael's, and then I went to St. Bernard's, and then Sarah High School. Wow. Okay. So junior high school was Bernard's. Yeah. Okay. And, and that was high school. Well, you know, in Catholic school, you never had junior high school. Oh. Okay. It was eight to twelve. So elementary school was kindergarten to to eighth, and then uh, high school was ninth to twelfth. Okay. There was no junior high. In high school, you played any sports? Yeah, football. Football. What position? I was a beast, running back. Really? Running back and defensive end, beast. Wow, so yeah. you play both sides. Both sides. That's dope. That's dope. My, my son, he he would play like DN, nose guard, and then play like right tackle. Yeah. You know, I help coach him a little bit. Uh, so now, growing up in Compton, Inglewood, uh, around your house, uh, uh, what would your mother and your, or your dad play as far as music is concerned? Yeah, so that's where my whole, you know, I always tell people, that's where my background came from. Because my mom was a classical pianist. She played in the church. She was a piano teacher, so she was always trying to teach me music. Wow. So I never went to learn because all I wanted to do was play football. Yeah. And then I had crazy uncles who went to Centennial, <laughs> and them fools was like listening to Parliament Funkadelic, Cameo, Barquet, Prince, Michael Jackson. And then my, my favorite uncle, who was the craziest, he was getting me into like Kiss 
And then he got me into like craft work and the last poet. So my brain was like all Everybody. over the place. Yeah. Wow. Wow. You, you know, it's funny because I love classical music. I just don't know too many composers. I listen to KUSC. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's what usually what I bump in my car. Uh, but I also love a lot of uh, what you mentioned about uh, Kiss. Yeah. My very first album was a Kiss album. And uh, I was in fourth grade. And my brother said, if you do good and you get a good report card, I'll buy you your first record. I did. I got good grades, and he asked me, you know, what what album do you want? So I, I said, I want the Kiss Love Gun album. Yeah, I remember and, that. And then he took me to the forum to go see them perform. Yeah, you know, so great memories. Now, uh, um, any brothers, any sisters? Nope, just me, only child. Really? Yeah. Wow, wow. You know, it's funny because I grew up with friends that were the only child, and me, it, it's different because. I used to always say, you know, as a kid, I hate my damn brothers. I hate my damn sisters. Yeah, yeah. Five brothers, four sisters. But he used to always say, I wish I had brothers. Yeah. You, ever, you ever feel like that? You know, it's weird, though. I didn't because I had cousins that just lived not too far from me. And then, you know, my mom would always drop me off my grandmother's house. And then her sons, they were a little older than me. So I had, like, technical brothers. They was cousins and uncles, but they was like my brothers anyway. So okay. I never missed it. And I, I like my I like my shit at home. When I got home, I was like, it's my shit. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so like about what age did you start playing football? Let's just say what, Pop Warner maybe? Yeah, I pl I've been playing football. I started playing football, what, Tiny Mike, Mighty Mike, Mighty like, Mike. like six yeah. years old, seven years old. Wow. And then like you said, it was funny. That's how I became so good as a running back because when I was young, I was um, big for my age. Like, I wasn't fat or chubby. I was just big, you know. Right, right. And I was a pulling guard. And, you know, then I played defensive end. And then as I got older, I didn't grow anymore. But I had that mentality of being able to scrap it up in the line. Right. So when I became a running back, I had no fear. I was just running fools over, you Damn. know, even though I wasn't that big. Damn. And, and you ever won any championships? Yeah. Um, I won. I played Pop Warner at Hawthorne. Okay. Yeah. So we won a championship, the Steelers, and then um, St. Bernard's, um, not varsity, but our um, JV team or freshman team, one of them won. And then Sarah, you know, Sarah was always good. Right, yeah. right. Okay. Um, around what time would you say did you start dabbling into music, whether it was piano, whether it was a, possibly a drum machine? Around how old do you think you were? Um, so my cousins who lived around the corner from my grandmother they were all in the military because i told them it was all crazy so they got sent away okay because they was getting in too much trouble so they sent them away to the military my cousin kenneth he was the one that never got in trouble he was like the smart one and he would come home from the navy which is boxes of stuff <laughs> and one day he came home and he had this huge look like a, a suitcase and it was black and it had these little latches on it. And he opened it up and it was a synthesizer. It was an ARC 2600. The wow. one that had all the wires, yeah. you know, and the oscillators and stuff. And, you know, I'm like, little kid, I'm like, what the fuck is that? And then every day, dude, I was just there. I couldn't get no sounds out of it because I didn't know you had to, you know, you had to plug right. the wires and turn the oscillators to get the sound. Finally, I figured it out, dude. And I started playing, like, funkadelic music off of it. Really? As a little kid. Like, Maggot Brain and, um, you know... Mommy, what's a uh, funkadelic? And I started like trying to learn all of that, and that was my first thing into it. Really? Yeah. Now, now, um, after high school, after you graduated high school, what, what did you get into next? Like, did, did did you go to the military? Did you get yourself a job, or did you immediately start getting into the music business? So we had to go back back in the high school, dude. Like, I got my first job. I've only had my like, technically. Two and a half jobs. I say two and a half because my first job was on Market Street at a shoe store putting shoes on old women. And that, that wasn't good. No. I was like 15 and a half. I remember that. And then I got another job at this at the this place called Century City Luggage at the Delamo Mall. Delamo Selling Mall. luggage. And we was like, me and my homeboy had figured out a little, you know, we was coming up because the owner wanted us to sell sets of luggage five piece set for 99 dollars. that's right. what they had but everybody who came in they didn't want five pieces of luggage yeah. they just wanted the one they wanted or maybe two and they would never buy the sets and he would get mad at us because nobody was buying the sets so we figured it out like all right this lady wants that one and the little one so we would sell them that one and the little one for 99 dollars. 
Oh, and wow. then somebody else was coming. We sell him that, and we make a couple hundred bucks off of ninety nine dollar <laughs> set. Give him his money, and we keep the rest. Sure, so you know, I did those two, and then um, about what year do you think that was? That was that had to be eighty one because wow. I graduated high school in eighty three, okay. and um, eighty one, eighty two, maybe. And then I met this guy because I was DJing at the time. I just started DJing because my pops had a, a radio show at Case. He was a talk radio host. And I would go in the control room and make mixtapes and do all of that. So I started DJing and somebody asked me, could I do their quinceanera? I didn't know what a quinceanera was. Right, like, right. But they was going to pay me 200, 250 bucks to do it. I'm like, well, I got some equipment because me and my boy, this one turntable, one turntable, a mixer, whatever. Right. So went and did it at this little event center in Lenox. And the owner of the event center owned a pet store and he was like man you guys did a good job he said uh i'll you know keep your number in case you want to you know we, we have something else and i was like well what do you do with this building when you don't use it right. he said just sit here i'm like look i dj these little high school or elementary school parties i could pack this sucker right here right and um he gave me a shot man he bought some speakers gave me some money to go buy some vinyl we did this thing we called it the cave like most of the west coast djs coming up came through the cave through at the some cave. time you know wow. it was like a teen club right friday saturday and it was safe for a while because it was a block from the linux police station so nobody really nutted up right and, you know later on it's just i kind of moved on so now 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 just for a dj's sake question uh, do you remember possibly what kind of turntable what kind of mixture you had during that time i know exactly because i had those um so I had the Techniques turntables, the... It they weren't the 1200? No, it was 11, 1150s or... The first ones I had was the straight tone arms, mm -hmm. you know, and it had the buttons that pushed down on the front. Right. And they were they were belt drive. So okay. we figured it out real quick. Like, uh, you had to put like four pieces of plastic on right. it to spin the record or whatever. So eventually I got to some 12s, but it took a while to get that. And I had a... I still got the Rixer. I had, I had a, a Radio Shack Tandy. Wow. The Tandy mixer yeah, yeah, from Radio yeah. Shack. Wow. Yeah. That my my first mixer was a Radio Shack. Uh the one with the fader, not necessarily the up and down one. Yeah, it had both. Yeah. yeah, that's what I had. The two VU meters and that, that was the shit back yeah. then. Yeah. That was the shit back then, you know. So um so you started DJing. Yep. And would you say you were already uh I guess playing music uh, were you good at uh, I, from yeah. the kid to where you were yeah, yeah, yeah I was already good at playing you know music because I used to mess around my mom's and I had the synthesizer thing so I had it in my head and when I was doing the cave um I remember I was buddies with Egypt because that was when Uncle Jam's army dances had started getting big yes and they were doing like Dorsey and Morningside and a lot of different high schools and then they started doing like the um was at the Veterans Auditorium and then working away up to the convention center and I was friends with them in Egypt and they had just bought an 808. Hmm. And I was like, damn, what the fuck is that? And the Egypt had it at his house, he was playing with the 808. And I'm like, I can't afford that shit. So I went to- uh, well, you, uh, you know, what do you think the 808 was going for during that time? They might've been like 1,200, 1,500. Wow. You know, that was a lot for us. Yeah. I mean, now you can't get one for that price. They way no. more. Yeah. But. I couldn't afford it, so I remember I was at, at uh, Toys R Us, and I remember buying Synsonic drums. That little thing had like four <laughs> little drum pads and little toms on them. Right. And I took that to the cave and be scratching, and then I would stop the music and play little drum beats on that and wow. chant shit, and people would keep dancing. And that's when I kind of realized, like, well, if people dancing to just a beat that I just made up, I might be able to make a record. And, you know, yeah. Fuck, that shit is fucking dope, man. Yeah. I mean, because today, you know, we have so much technology. Again, it's just my opinion. We have so much more today than we ever had, uh, you know, growing up that uh, I thought less was better. Uh, uh, it gave you more time or should I say creativity came yeah. out of less yeah, yeah, yeah. than today that we have more. And I, I just... I just don't like. I have a hard. I was telling you earlier. I have a hard time with today's music. I yeah. just love good music. Um, now, during that time when you were DJing and making beats, what, what would what would you say were the hottest records out at that time, possibly? So at that time, and I tell people this all the time because people just think rap was just always there. I'm like, nah, dude. In the '80s, top forty was like 
Top 40. Top 40. It was punk, new wave, R&B, you know, disco. Disco was kind of still rolling around, but we were playing like Depeche Mode. We were playing Prince and Michael Jackson and Parliament Funkadelic and Zap. And then we were playing, playing like um, Blondie. Yes. And, you know, and stuff like that. So we were playing like all this music and people just dance. Devo. Devo. Devo yeah. was hot back then. Yeah. You know, we was playing all that kind of stuff because that's when the whole, everybody's wearing the Devo glasses <laughs> and all of that stuff. So You know, I'm, and I'm glad you're bringing this up because today I meet like what I would call new school DJs and they ask me, Hey, Tone, growing up, did you play everything? And I said, you fucking had to. Yeah. If you wanted to get hired, you yeah. had to play you everything. You had to. Uh, most guys would say, well, I'm just a funk guy. Other people say, I'm just a hip-hop guy. I don't understand that because when you do weddings, quinceañeras, uh, house parties, birthday parties, you got to play everything. You got to play everything. You know, yeah. so. Me and Egypt just did a, a wedding. Really? Yeah, one of, some fan that we did his wedding in Germany. He flew us to Germany to do his wedding. His boy live here, loved our music, said, hey, I'm getting married. Could you and Egypt do my wedding? And then they paid us a lot of money. I'm like, we wouldn't kill it. Like, wow. we brought break dancers. We, you know, brought the whole wow. scene and performed live and everything. It was crazy. Wow, wow. Yeah. So now you're DJing. You're making little beats with this little, if I may call it a little drum machine, yeah, a I guess. Yeah, drum machine, yeah. When did you make the transition from that to like, okay, maybe... Uh, how I'm going to look into making a record. When did that come about? Yeah, so me and Dre used to hang out tight, right? Okay. And I would always be over at Lonzo's house with the wrecking crew when they, they were still DJing, right? Because wow. I would go to Eve After Dark and hang out. And they were getting ready to make a record. They were talking about it. And then um, Egyptian Lover and freaking, you know, uh, Uncle Jam's Army was talking about it. And I used to hang with them too. I hung out with everybody. Right. So I was like, Everybody making a record. Ain't nobody asked me to make no record. Fuck that. I make my own record. Right, so right. I had like 500 bucks saved up. And uh, I said, calling, you know, studios. I ain't know anything about studios. I've never been in one. I was calling around. It's like, dang, how many hours? I'm, you know, it's okay. You probably need about $1,000 because I don't know what you want to do, but you're going to do this, this, this. And then you got to mix it and you got to do this. You got to pay for the tape. You got to pay for this tape. And I was like, damn, that's a lot of money. Right. So the dude I was working for at the cave owned a pet store. And I was working at the pet <laughs> store slanging 50 pound bags of um, pigeon feed and chicken feed. Right, right. And uh, he gave me 500 bucks. So I had $1,000, went to a studio, never been in the studio, dude had no equipment and he had at that time and it's funny you say less is more because there's two less is more stories i got and one of them like could tell the truth on that he had a juno 60 okay. rolling juno 60 yes. with the sequinter with arpeggiator on it and he had an 808 wow and he was a guitar player so i freaking just made a beat he said what do you want i'm like i don't know i wanted to, i don't know what i wanted to sound like i just want to do something and I'm like he said well what kind of person I said I'm kind of strange man I like listening to all kind of shit so yes. we called the song Strange Life and it actually came out like a rap almost rap new wave it was this mix of sounds right. Prince because I was really into Prince at the time and put it out and you know hit the radio Damn. and that was at 16 I was 16 years old 16 and a half 16 years old because I remember it was a blue label from blue label yep yeah that man. was my first Fuck. thing and how I got it out is I went I heard everybody's going to McCola, get their records done. So I'm like, fuck it, I'll go to McCola. So I went over there, caught the bus over there. And I was like, well, how much it cost for me to put my record out? And they told me, I was like, fuck that. I was like, fuck that. I can't get that shit pressed. And Russ Parr was there. Russ Parr, Bobby Jimmy. Bobby Jimmy. And he was the morning show DJ at K-Day. And he heard the song. I was playing it for, you know, um, the people there. And it was, he was like, well, who produced it? So I'm like, I produced it. And he go, you a producer? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yeah, I'm a producer. He's like, well, I'll tell you what, I'll put it on my label. And then I'm, you know, Bobby, Jimmy, I'm Russ Parr, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I got this thing. I'm dropping, you know, Bobby, Jimmy and the Critters. Yes. Like you can produce all our stuff for us. And that's how we trade Just off. Just like that? Yeah. So I ended up producing all of the Bobby, Jimmy and the Critter records after the only one I didn't produce was We Like Ugly Women. I think that was his first single. That was correct? his first single, and that one was, uh, I think, Egypt and them did that. Okay. And, now, uh, did you do Roaches? I did Roaches. I did Roaches. I did L.A. Rapper, New York Rapper. I really? Did, 
every song, even the slow songs, I did all of that. Dude, I fucking loved Bobby Jamie, man. Yeah. I loved him because I remember, uh, and I, I remember when we did the, in, when we interviewed you, I brought the story up that I saw you years ago in the 80s perform uh, uh, your song. Yeah. And you were there with Bobby Jimmy at a club in Long Beach called Grand Central Station. I remember that. Yeah, I remember yeah, that and club. I saw you that. I remember because you had a jewelry curl. Yeah, and I'm not going to lie to you. As yeah. a kid, you know, you see the hair, you know, cause, yeah, yeah. you know, you see Prince wearing yeah, it. Yeah. And you, as a kid, I'm thinking, that's fucking bad. Yeah. yeah. You know, I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah, man. that's why I did it. And the funny thing is, everybody's, I didn't have a jerry curl. I had curly hair. So I would just put the stay soft throw in there. I never got, <laughs> I never got the perm. So it was just like my hair. But yeah, that's why I did it because my thing was, I love girls, man. And I was like, they Prince, love that shit. Prince got all the women. Yes. You know, all the girls walk around wearing camisoles and lace. Oh, and man. I was like, I'm with this. Every girl was Apollonia, Vanity. Yay. I had like two, three of them. <laughs> you oh, know, so. shit. Those were the days, man. Yeah, man. So. So, so so, to back up just a little bit, you said you were hanging with Jure. How, yeah. uh, my, I want to ask you, you know, for the for the fans' sake, how did you end up meeting Dre? So we all knew each other from DJing in the hood. Like okay. we, Everybody kind of did the same circuits. You know, like you did the same schools. And then as we got better DJs, we would start doing like skate land, world on wheels. You know, we would all, they would hire a bunch of DJs to do it together. Right. Like there's some old flyers. You'll see like Arabian Prince, Egyptian Lover, and or, you know, Dr. Dre or whatever. We would always do DJ the same thing. So we became friends. And like I said, when they started making records, man, I said, I got to hop on this. And yeah. I, I popped in and, and did mine. Uh, uh, how far or how long were you with uh, Bobby Jimmy and the Critters? I did all these songs. Like, I did every album to the end with them. Wow. And um, even when I was in NWA, I was still doing that stuff as well. Really? And even when I was doing NWA, that, and my stuff. But I wasn't doing Arabian Prince anymore. I was doing Professor X, because I'm also Professor X. Right, right. And I was doing that kind of craft work, electro stuff. Wow. Okay, before we get into the electro stuff, because uh, uh, I love that stuff. That was my favorite stuff to DJ, man. I fucking love that stuff. And being a battle DJ back in the days, I used to love to cut that up over hip hop, yeah. you know. But now you did the Bobby Jimmy stuff. When you, what was the first Bobby Jimmy song you did? Um, uh, it would have to have been because Ro Roaches came out later. It was probably like L.A. rapper or New No New York rapper was first. New York rapper, New was, York first. rapper was first. I did that whole album. Wow. And then there was like that slow song, You're My Woman. Yes. Big Butt. Big. I did. Wait a minute. Was Big Butt first? Maybe Big Butt was first. Big Butt was the big hit. So I think Big Butt was first. That was a Big Butt. A, a Big Butt. Yeah. That's dope. Yeah. yeah now, so. for, for everybody that loves to go to the NAM and buys equipment, what did you use to create those songs? All I had, I had a 808 and uh juno one, no it wasn't i didn't have a rolling i had a yamaha dx7 right because mm -hmm. i bought that because it had cartridges and you could change the sounds with the cartridges mm -hmm. and so i had that and then russ bought a emulator too big ass that's why i got a back problem now that's like a way like 400 pounds wow. and i had an emulator too and then we even had a um a dmx and the expander you know, the sequencer that goes with the DMX drum mm. machine. So we had, like, there's a picture out there somewhere else I could find it of me. I had a, when we traveled, I was playing, like, freaking Prince and the Revolution. I had a rack. Really? Where I had the, I was playing live on stage with Bobby, Jimmy, and the Critters. I had wow. my drum machines, I had my keyboards, and I was playing, you know. Wow. And, and, and by how old were you doing all this on stage? Between 17, 17, 18, maybe, about that time. Wow. Well, I, I, I'm fascinated because, you know, I, I'm I'm 51 now, so obviously yeah. I'm a little bit younger than you. But to to see that, it's fucking amazing. And to hear these stories. Um, so you, you're with Bobby Jimmy and the Critters about, or when did you make the transition to NWA? How did that come about? Who welcomed you? Or how did you become a part of that? So what happened was me and Dre would always, you know, kick it. We'd go to Venice Beach together, hang out. He had this, I always tell the story, he had this raggedy RX-7. It wasn't raggedy, it was just an <laughs> RX-7 that Lonzo had gave him with no back window because somebody had broken the back window and stole his uh, jacket, his wrecking crew jacket and his uh Block punt. He had a block punter Alpine. They had stole it. Wow. And uh, we would always hang out and roll. And I remember, you know, we were not really happy what we were doing because we were making hit records, but we didn't know about 
business at the time. Right. So we were getting paid, but we wasn't, felt we weren't getting paid what we wanted to get paid for what we was doing. So we always talked about that. And then uh, Dre had met, you know, the little neighborhood pharmaceutical technician, right. Easy. Right. <laughs> and Easy was saying that he didn't want to do what he was doing no more. He wanted to get out. And we got together one day. I remember we talked about it. And then um, we was at my mom's house all talking about it. And then it was like, well, fuck it. Let's do it. He said, he got some money. We'll put some shit together. I had equipment. So I had all the gear already. Right. So I was like, fuck it. Take my gear. We'll sit down. We'll make a bunch of songs and do it. And then, you know, Ren was Easy's homie. Lived down the street from him. Uh, Yellow was Dre's homie. Um, Ren, not Ren, but uh, Cube lived down the street from uh, Dre's aunt. Okay. So that's how kind of everybody ended up getting together. It was just kind of like, dude, what y'all doing? Oh, you making records? What you, come on. Look, what you want? Come on. You know, it was right. just kind of like that. And we just did this shit. Wow. So the Strange Life record comes out. Did you do any other singles by yourself? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Strange Life. And then when I got with Bobby Jimmy and the Critters, I dropped It Ain't Tough, which was next which was a little more closer to what I wanted sound-wise. Because I hadn't figured, I knew I wanted that craft work electro sound, wow. but going in the studio the first time, I didn't know how to get it. You know, I'd it was kind of like, yeah. how do I get that sound? But when I got to It Ain't Tough, I kind of figured out clicks and, you know, right, how to right. get that sound, and I did that. And there's a funny joke on that song, man. In the breakdown, Russ was doing background vocals with me, and he was chewing gum. Wow. <laughs> and you could hear it on the mic, and we played it back. I was like, that should sound funny. Like put some put some echo on that shit and leave it. And we actually left it in the song. Wow. And uh so we did that. Strange Life, it ain't tough. Then my third uh single, which was the one that's worth a lot of money, because I see it on like Discogs for like two hundred dollars or five hundred bucks. Wow. It was uh Innovator, Innovative Life, and on the other side was Take You Home Girl and Let's Hit the Beach. It was like four cuts on there and wow. it's that was the, the last arabian prince record that i did no i take that back because i did situation hot too and i don't even remember yeah, when i, I did situation that. hot situation hot was somewhere in the, in there right. somewhere yeah now who would you say uh inspired you to do electro funk i know it was hot at the time yeah would you say it was crap work it was my uncle so my uncle who was letting me hear all that stuff right man when i got that craft work record dude i was like the computer power I think that came out in 77 or something like yeah, that. That's the one with numbers. Number, that was it for me right yeah. there. I was like, what the hell is that? And at the time, I wasn't even thinking about Planet Rock. Like, oh yeah, well they did it, I'm gonna do it. I was just a Kraftwerk fan, like yeah. deep in the Kraftwerk. And I'm like, I, yeah, I wanna do that. That just, <laughs> that was, that thing was banging, you know? Yeah, yeah everybody know pop, and I was a pop locker too. Yeah. You know, and I was the pop lock to it, so yeah. Pop lock and yeah. Arabian Prince. Yes, yeah, sir. Before we go to commercial, because uh, uh, we're going to take a 10-minute break, uh, how did you come up with the name Arabian Prince? It was at Skateland USA in Compton. Me and Egypt were there, and a girl came up to me. I don't know who she was. i never seen her again. And she walked up, and she goes, what's your name? And Egypt's like, Egyptian lover. And she's like, what's your name? And I'm like, DJ Prince. Cause I used to dress like Prince, right? Right. And she goes, you should call yourself Arabian Prince because every time I see y'all, y'all together, and it's just like, ping. All right, it was kind of cool. It stuck. Wow. And I just kept it. Yeah. Well, no, that that well, that is a dope ass name because you know what's funny because me not knowing the story growing up, I always put that Egyptian lover and Arabian Prince name together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and I didn't even know this no, you know, yeah. growing up. But that that shit is dope, man. But even Egyptian lover, you know, I would love to have him on here. Oh, he'll come. He'll come because I love. I, I mean, you know, it's funny. Like I. I Growing up, we used to always say, all that motherfucker got to do is just breathe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, and that shit was banging. Banging. You know? And then yeah. another one, boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Man, I was like, and then it was another one like, uh, uh, uh. Oh, yeah. I'm like, shit, how many times can he breathe? But that yeah. shit was hard. Hard. That shit was hard. But Hell yeah. we're going to go to a commercial. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about um, uh, transitioning from Electro Funk over to NWA. Yep. When we come back. Once again, the Rody Mixtape Documentary. Uh, go ahead and order it at documentary.com. We'll be back in about 10 minutes. Uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and uh, put it in the little chat comment box. And uh, I'll try to get to them as fast as I can. Uh, call a friend, text a friend, 
I always say page a friend, slap a friend, and let them know that I'm here with Brother Arab, the Arabian Prince, and we will be back in about 10 minutes, so hang in there. Yo, right about now, Dr. Dre is in effect. Cold tan shit up with my man Steve at the Rodeon Swap Meet. And we here to lay it on the line. To all the fucking niggas out there claiming our tapes and shit, we just got one thing to say. To get funky fresh music easy motherfucking e and my homeboy dr dre mc ren is in effect and you know we don't play the rhodium is hitting but you know you can't leave until you get a deaf ass tape from steve oh steve oh steve oh steve just give me just one more tape oh steve oh steve oh steve just give me just one more tape oh steve oh steve oh steve just give me just one more tape oh steve oh steve oh steve just give me just one more tape yeah man i came all the way down to the rodeo Man, like the NWA and Easy E music hit the Rhodium Swap Me mixtapes first. Like when we dropped our records, man, it was like it was cool putting your records out, but even though people knew who Dre was and I was and Cube and Yella before, they didn't really know who Easy was. But not until you know Boys in the Hood and some of that you know Fat Girl and LA is the place that stuff hit the mixtapes, man. That's what kind of put it out there for people to know, like, what is this Easy e and what is this NWA thing? So I think it was like a big, big push. The Rhodium Swap Meet uh, mixtapes had a huge impact on, on hip hop and the hip hop culture because it was different. And, um, you know, wasn't nobody doing it like that. You know, you had New York, they was doing mixtapes, but, you know, you had NWA who was saying whatever the fuck they wanted to say. Motherfuckers wasn't doing that shit, speaking how they wanted to speak, you know? And what that did was was open up a, a lane for uh, what they call gangster rap today and, and the hip hop culture. And uh, it really it really opened up lanes for, for, you know, pretty much for the West Coast gangster shit to get out. and. Uh, Nobody else was doing that, and it was just different. And, and people were scared to say what the what they wanted to say. And uh, you know, that buzz came from Steve at the Rodium Swap Meet. You know, uh, working with Dre and Easy, and, and created a, a whole plethora of good music, <laughs> uh, and and it, it created a lot of uh, lanes and opened up a lot of lands from artists like myself to be able to come out you know i'm i'm part of the uh the, the tree i'm a branch on the tree that that dre and easy started you know and then on my branch you got snoop the dog pound uh 50 cent eminem and all of those guys you know that that's all on my branch the chronic and uh that's what it created man Yo, this is Daniel Jones, the D to the motherfucking G Media Clips. Here with your boy, Tony A. the Wizard on the Rhodium Radio Show.
What up, what up, it's Mr. Soto. You guys are now in tune to Rhodium Radio right here on Tony Vision on YouTube. Yep. Yo, what up, this is Mellow Man Ace at Pavino, and you tuned in to Rhodium Radio with my man Tony A. Keep it locked. Yo, what's up, this is Bozo, a.k.a. Emiliano. You tune in to Rhodium Radio on Tony Vision's YouTube channel. Let's get it. Big G, Rhodium Radio, Tony A in full effect. Stay tuned, watch, listen. This is how we doing it over here. What's up? This is Esther Dazzle, Spanish Fly, Harbor Area's finest. Tune in to Tony A on Rhodium Radio. What up? This is DJ Trick, Spanish Fly, and you're watching Tony A on the Rhodium Radio Show. What's up to my homeboy Dre, my homeboy Prince of Jazz, and the girls with the big ol' ass. So trip, I'm about to bust one more time to let y'all niggas know just what's on my mind. Six in the morning, police at my door. Fresh to be this week across my bathroom floor. Out my back window, I make my escape. Didn't even get a chance to grab my old school tape. Mad with no music, but happy for free. And the street to a player is the place to be. Got a knot in my pocket, weighing least the grand. Yo, welcome back everybody to Rhodium Radio. I'm here with Brother Arab, the Arabian Prince, and we're gonna try to get to all your guys' questions. Somebody actually said, why does he still look 35 years old? What the hell's the secret? That's what somebody asked, man. Hey. You look good, brother. Thank you. You know, and another guy, I think it's some Samoan Shaka, or whatever the hell his name is, he said, uh, uh, Tony asked some real questions, like what kind of cereal? I, hey, you know what? I like to ask detailed questions because I'm a very detailed guy. Like, you know what? Hey, what kind of water are you drinking? You know, yeah. I just like little details, especially in the studio. Uh, growing up, uh, when my brother first bought that record, uh, uh, Brick, the song Daz, yep. I, I was always like, what? what is that? Wah, wah, wah. Like, as a kid, like, what the hell is that? Yeah. So I think everything for me was in the details. I wanted to know everything. So... So I'm glad you picked up on that. So now you're doing obviously electro punk. From uh, before break, we were talking about that. You were Bobby Jimmy and the Critters. You guys are forming NWA, and you're bringing that electro punk sound. Obviously, we could tell with Panic Zone, uh, right. uh, something to dance to, uh, and eventually JJ Fad. But before we get to JJ Fad, you guys get together and. Um, 
how would you say, did you guys immediately start recording at Audio Achievements? So, yes and no. Yeah, I guess that was the first only real studio we used because we did some little demo stuff at Lonzo's spot. Did some little demo stuff with my little, I had like one of them Tascam four tracks. Yes. But yes. the first studio and only studio that we used back then was Audio Achievements and, you know, Donovan Smith spot. So, yeah. Now, now, now much love and respect to Donovan and Dirt Biker Smith. Uh, uh, I met him in 1989 uh, when Steve Yano would take me over there. Uh, Might have been even late 88. But uh, um, well, how did you guys hear of Audio Achievements? Man, it was just like, Find a studio, you know, there find a studio. There, there was one and we ended up going over there and, and, and checking it out. And I think Lonzo had already used it for some early Wrecking Crew shit or some later Wrecking Crew stuff. Okay. Yeah. You know, uh, before we get into the details of, of Donovan Sound, you know, the, his board and everything, I went there recently. Okay, mm -hmm. I went to recently. And I'll be honest with you, it's, it saddened me and I'll tell you why. Okay, they broke it up. I heard it. Yes, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I mean, I remember, okay, La Capilla, the mm -hmm. restaurant right around. Mm -hmm. I, I went to eat there. So I was with a buddy of mine. I said, hey, let's go check out this studio. So we walked by, the door was open. Like it was like cracked open. So I kind of just like pushed it in. And it was a, some dude, like maybe like about eight dudes in there smoking weed and drinking cr round, Crown Royal or whatever. Yeah. And I was like, hey man, uh, um, can, you mind if I come in? Are you guys in the middle of a studio session or something? Yeah. Go, yeah, come on in. They said it was a studio, but it looked like fucked up. Like yeah. they broke it up into rooms. Yeah, that's what I heard. And I went in there and it just smelled like fucking weed. Uh, the only room that was still somewhat, it, it was badly damaged, but was somewhat like it looked like back then was the actual room where Donovan would sit on the oh, board. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, but everything else looked like demo rooms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks nothing like, and it, it saddened me because to think that so much classic west coast history came out of this this place and now to the way it is now you yeah, know? yeah. That's what uh, it is but you know what's funny the restaurant you went to yes i went there last year with donovan we went back over there wow the people who were there when we were there are still there, still the, there. The, the waitress was still there yeah she wow. remembered us it's crazy wow. now uh, um one thing that uh, i hope i'm wrong but one thing that a lot of people don't talk about is that engineering sound that Donovan had there yeah. at his studio. Right. You know, because I remember when we did I'm Not Your Puppet, a song called Jack Move, a song called Take a Ride, uh, the I'm Not Your Puppet remix, uh, uh, and another song. We did like five songs there, and he was our engineer. He has such a great sound coming dude, into the studio, man. everything. This dude, even to this day, you know, could we partners in some other ventures right now, he's... A perfectionist he's a master of his craft as far as engineering and sound and all of that and that board see everybody was trying to get into them ssl and them neve boards yes. but he had that trident adb the adb man that sound was just yeah. warm and in big you know it, it it fit the 808 it fit right. hip-hop and yeah okay so so now uh we were talking about so you guys get in the studio you guys are producing the, because if I'm correct, the NWA album came out first and then the Easy one yeah. came out. Right. Uh, but J.J. Fab was before that, if I'm correct. Yeah, it was It was kind of, well, J.J. Fab was between the NWA EP and Straight Outta Compton. Because you remember we did, and this is what I always clear up, because a lot of people are like, man, I love that NWA and the Posse. And I'm like, well, I don't, because that's a bootleg. And they're like, what do you mean? I said, we did an EP called yes. NWA. When we left McCola to go to Priority to make Straight Outta Compton, McCola, want to be slick, found a whole bunch of other stuff, Feel the Fresh Crew and all that, made an NWA album and called it NWA and a Posse. Right. That was, we never authorized that. But later on, we ended up suing and getting it back. And it just, well, everybody's buying it anyway. So we right. just put it out there as an album. But we never authorized that so now that cover that infamous cover that everybody's on it looks like a bunch of gang bangers yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. in the alley how did that picture come about we were just walking around trying to find somewhere to take a picture and then all the homies was there with us anyway so everybody we knew was there and even though they weren't in the group we was like hey man hop on here let's do this thing and right. boom we just hit it and, off. and without dropping any names but there were, were some people that were in the picture 
that still go on and tell people they were in the way. Right. And really, they were just in the picture. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There was only six of us, you know. Yeah. That's what it was. Some people don't think I was in the group. I'm like, hey, I don't care. <laughs> I... <laughs> there's, there's enough pictures of all you guys together, yeah. so I don't know how somebody could say that. Yeah. But um, now, uh, how did you meet J.J. Fad to bring them to, you know, audio yeah. treatments to Ruthless? So, me and Dre, we met probably all of us. They were at one of our shows, the girls. And they were in a group. There was just some girls that we met, and I was ended up dating one of the girls in the group. Dre ended up messing around with another girl, and they lived way out in Rialto. Okay. So we would drive to Rialto, we'd go hang out with them, right? And they would always say, "We want to make a record. We want to come hang out in the studio." Dre, you know, Dre is very like non-tolerant of that. You know, let I me mean, y'all whack. Like, I ain't gonna mess with y'all. Y'all ain't <laughs> no rappers, you know. But me, I'm more kind of laid back about shit. I'm like whatever. And then I was in the studio one day and it wasn't even audio achievements i was somewhere else doing a professor x record because i couldn't get an audio achievements because we was doing other shit there so i was doing my professor x record they was hanging out with me and i had like four or five hours of studio time left over and they were like let's mess let's mess around let's make a record hi right. so i remember i had my emulator and i sampled at the time another whole bites the dust i mean another one bites the dust and uh, uh, yes uh, and then we did another whole bites to us of them dissing East Coast girl rappers. And I was concerned. I always say, like, right, I right. was concerned because I didn't think they were the best rappers to be right. going after Roxanne Shante and the real rock. I'm like, they about to like. Right, right. So I said, look, I got about an hour left. Let's do this other song real fast, Supersonic. Right. And I'm good at making these electro beats. Had the 808, bam. Had the uh, Rolling, I mean, the, the Yamaha DX7, bam. Threw some together. They rapped on it really, really quick. And that was the B side. And when we got to try to get it on the radio, the radio started playing supersonic. Really? Yeah. So we had to like go back and make it a single. And I had put it out on Dream Team Records at the time. Because I the Dream Team was orange label. Yeah, Dream Team was hot at that time. And Rudy and Snake was my boys. And I used to do some shit with them too. So I put it on a label because I'm like, and I gotta give them shouts, dude. Doubt now you probably remember this. I went to the drive-in movie once, dude, and and at the intermission, I'm sitting there, and I look up at the screen, and it was like, Dream Team, -da -da. and their video was playing at the movie theater. I was like, I'll be down. They played their video on the movie theater screen at the drive-in. No shit. That's how big they was with that song at that time. Wow. And that's when I was like, oh, I'm putting Supersonic on their label, you yeah. know? So I put it on their label first, but when we did, when we formed NWA, and started Ruthless Records, it was kind of like family. Like, we own this together. Let me take the record back and put it on Ruthless because I wanted the money to go to help build Ruthless Records. And, right. you know, that kind of helped fund a lot of the NWA shit that was about to come out. Wow, wow. So now, uh, you, you, now, I don't know if this is true. I had talked to this one guy, like, maybe about a year ago. And he had told me whether it's true or not. That's why I want to find out from mm -hmm. you that before there were five girls in JJ Fad, yep, and one of them was a Latina. Yep, that's true. Yeah, it's true. So JJ Fad actually stands for Juana, Juanita, Fatima, Annie, and Dania. That's what JJ Fad means. Mm -hmm. Annie was a Hispanic girl that Dre was messing around with at the time back then, mm -hmm. and then we put it out with those five girls. And then when we brought it to Ruthless, the girls was having some infighting. I never knew why or what happened with that. But um, when we redid it on Ruthless, I redid the music. And we had two of the original girls, Juana and Baby D, Juana and Dania. And then they brought in a new girl, Michelle, that made the right. JJ Fat that you see today. You know, the, the reason why I was able to tell when it was on Dream Team and when it was on Ruthless, because when I heard... Uh, supersonic again if I'm correct if my memory memory serves me right it had like a water drop yeah and that was that was baby D doing with her there's actually uh, the video from uh, Dre's documentary um, the defiant ones right. showing her on the video doing that with her mouth Wow. Yeah, 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 that shit's dope. That shit mm -hmm. is, I remember because I was like, "Why does it sound so fatter? It sounds so yeah, 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 doper, yeah. you know." So now, um, you guys re-release -re it, if I'm correct, through Ruthless. Through Ruthless, yeah. And then it just goes through the roof. Goes through the roof, yeah. And they get the first, they get the first um, major record deal right. on Atco on Atlantic. 
Wow. And then, you know, we followed up with a deal. Do, do you still have your plaques? Yeah, I still got my plaques. Oh, yeah. Wow. So now, uh, so Panic Zone is out. Mm -hmm. um, you have um, Supersonic. Right. And now you have something to dance to. And, and it's funny, I was just bumping that song earlier because I, I love that shit. Yeah. And um, it had that humming. Doom, 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 yeah, doom, yeah. From yeah. Sly and the Family Stone. Yep. Uh, now, after that, was there anything else that you released that was that that type of fast electro funk stuff? Um, so I'm going to clear something up first, too, because I always get like, you always got them haters out there and I ain't in the trolls and shit. I don't care because, you know, everybody who know me, know I don't care about one fame or whatever. I just care about business. But people got to understand the reason that there was a panic zone. The reason that there was a something to dance to is because we knew that we weren't going to be able to get gangster rap on the radio. Right. And when we started doing that kind of music, what was hot then? Freaking electro funk. Electro funk. That's what was hot. Yeah. So we did Panic Zone to let motherfuckers know that, hey, NWA's got an album coming out. Here's a party cat. Here's our party track. Right. Go get the album. Same thing with on the second. Here's something to dance to. Go get the album. So it was kind of like more of a strategic move. To get people to know that there was something out, right? You know, because right. they weren't playing that kind of stuff on the radio back then. Now, now, now here's another thing because I, I like to bring it up because, uh, okay, when Chicano rappers like Kid Frost, and I'll just say uh, I, I shouldn't even call it Chicano rappers when Latino rappers came out like Kid Frost, um, Melo Manes, Lighter Shade of Brown, etc. When, when those cr came out, they were never referred to in the very beginning as Chicano rappers. Right. They, they were just rappers. Rappers, yeah. Okay, now, the reason why uh, later on, maybe like late 90s, they started calling it Chicano rap. Now, I asked that to ask to ask this. When you guys started forming NWA, was, were you guys calling it gangster rap at the time? Nah, we never did. It, it, that's the other thing that kind of always made me scratch my head because all we were doing, we weren't glorifying anything. You grew up in the hood. Like, right. this is shit you saw every single day. Every day. Like, every day. Like, right. when we talked about the police, it was because you couldn't go from your house to the freaking Compton swap meet without getting pulled over. Right. If you had a pay, why you got a pager? So my mama can call me. You know what I mean? Like, like this guy got a pager, I'm a drug dealer. Right. Or just because I got a car with some rims on it, I'm a drug dealer, they, they should take my car apart, dude. Take my... I had a big ass um, speaker box in the back. Right. They would pull the speaker box out, or, take or, it apart. Or if you had Dayton's. Yeah, if you had Dayton's, whatever, man. You know, so all that stuff, the crackheads in the neighborhood, the strawberries, all of that stuff was just stories yes. that we saw in the neighborhood. And, and and that's why it blew up because we were all able to relate to the truth that you guys were giving us on Bible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I t I'll tell you one song that really fucking blew my mind and it gave me goosebumps just... Even now, just thinking about it, when I first heard uh, Dope Man. Oh, yeah. Because I remember one time, Jure was sampling uh, Roxanne Chante Payback, that kick yeah. and that snare. Mm -hmm. Boy, and he, when he was hitting it, I started putting two and two together. Because I've, I've always been good in my mind of playing Name That Tune. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When a DJ is scratching a snare, I know where, you know where, where, it, break came record, yeah. where it came from. So when he was like, boom, boom, ka, ka, boom, boom, ka, I was like, God damn. And and uh, funky worm, you know, yep. just it was just fucking an amazing time. And I remember one of the last times that I was in the studio there with Dre. I remember he was drinking a forty ounce, and he had just played. Uh, of course, this was later on. Cuba had already left. Uh, Hundred miles and running. Yep. And he had asked me, uh, um, you know, what do you think? And I'll be honest with you, to have a guy like Dre ask me, what do I think? Like, he wanted my opinion. I didn't think my opinion mattered. And I said, well, I don't think my opinion matters. He goes, no, what would you, what would you add? Because I think there's yeah. something missing. And I, I said, I don't know. Maybe going into the chorus or maybe going into some of the, because um, uh, uh, it didn't really have a chorus. It had, like, uh, the police. Yeah. And, you know, maybe just some, you know, yeah. something like that. Yeah. You know? And he was just, like, nodding his head. I don't know if he ever really did it. but Yeah. Well, it I does was, do that. It does scratch going into the breaks. Yeah, yeah. you know, so I, I'm just kind of thankful that he was always open. You know, people ask me, you know, how was Dre when he would have come to your house because he would rap on these mixtapes? Yeah. You know, I looked up to Dre because he was the world-class wrecking crew. I, I, I didn't know that the NWA that he would, what he would become later. Yeah. So I just saw him still as Dre from the world-class wrecking crew working on this NWA album, you know. 
I didn't see Easy and Cube like mega stars because I would see them at the studio or when they would come to my house and rap on the mixtapes. Right. You know, so when people say, you know, how was it? I always say they were cool, you know, they were professional, you know. I mean, I, I didn't really know how old they were at the time, but but to me, those little moments that I got to spend over their audio achievements, uh, uh, one day I'm going to share with my grandkids because to me, they're like uh, beautiful memories that I get to live with. And yeah. to be able, once again, to be able to interview people like yourself and share these stories and shed light, it's just amazing, man. And, and, I appreciate um, it. But so now the JJ Bad drops, NWA drops, Easy E drops. Yep. Now, out of... If I had to ask you, out of the NWA or Easy e album, which one would you like the best? The NWA album, because it's like the OG. You right. know what I mean? And, and you know, no disrespect to Rest in Peace, Easy E. Doing this album was a motherfucker. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because he wasn't really a rapper. Right. And, you know, the stories are all out there. Dre told the story. Everybody tells the story how you had to, like, literally punch his verses together. Right. And, and also, too... You know, he was always in the streets because he was the, he was always a the real nigga. You know, right. he was the one that was really out there doing that thing. And um, you always had to find him and get him. Whereas he, I'll be back hours later, whatever. I mean, you know, right. but it, it was harder to get that done. Right. You know, I'm um, you know, and and it's crazy because one time he played me a verse, and I'm trying to remember what song it was. It might have been. Um, God, what's that one? She swallowed it. Oh yeah, it don't yeah. matter. Just don't buy yeah, it. Yeah. You know. And I remember uh, he played me the lyrics. He said, what did you think? And I said, I thought it was pretty good. And he goes, he did that. He goes, he's, he's going to do it again tomorrow. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. You know, I thought it was pretty good. But yeah, yeah. I know Dre's a damn perfectionist. Yeah, perfectionist. Yeah. You know, so, and, and I and I love that about him. I remember he told me one day, when you come in the studio and work with me, you got to bring your A game. You know, mm -hmm. and I was like, yeah. So I, I picked up a lot of these little quotes from him. You know, uh, uh, and, and I every time I work with somebody, people would tell me, man, you're a fucking hard dude to work with. But you have to remember who shared these things with me, you know, uh, uh, the best, yeah. if, you, if you will. So I'm going to apply that to what I'm doing, you know. Yeah. And I remember he said, a producer's only as good as the artist that he's working with. And it was true. It was true. You know, I'm going to share something with you that uh, I've never shared with anybody. Steve took a high seat demo to Dre mm -hmm. one time and asked him, uh, would you work with them? Would you do a beat for us on high seat's album? Yeah. And he said this, nah. And I was there standing there and I was kind of like, they were hoping like, please do a, a beat for us, you know? Yeah, yeah. And Steve goes, how come? And he said, I don't see gold in him. That's what he said. Yeah. yeah. So I understood now when he said, uh, you know, producer's only as good as the artist that he works with. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But you know what? I didn't know nothing about producing. I see was still a teenager. So we did it, you know, yeah. we, we were pretty good. So now, at what point in time of those albums did you decide, okay, I'm gonna leave? Yeah, bounce. Yeah. So that was literally, we had just done Straight Outta Compton, right? And the JJ Fad thing was blowing up. Yes. And I ain't seen no money yet. And I'm like, wait a minute. So I was making money on this before I brought it in. <laughs> I bring it over here and everything going to a black hole and every time you ask for money, it was like, hey, can I get paid? Uh, Jerry, what's up? Uh, you need to talk to Easy. All right. So now Easy's in charge. I'm like, I, I, I thought it was a family thing that we all like. Right. Hey. All right, Easy, what's up, man? Oh, uh, you need to talk to Jerry. All right. Okay, here we so go. So it was back and forth. Yeah, and, and I, I never blamed Easy because Easy wasn't, Easy wasn't a business, man. He, wasn't in the, he was in the streets. He didn't care. So it was Jerry always doing this deflect thing. Oh, well, we're going to do this. And when we were going tour, you got, you know, a lot of people do tour, you know, you get half the money up front and you get the other half when you do the show. Right. We would never see the deposit money. Wow. And I'm like, that's a lot of money, dude, that I ain't getting in. And I think me, two reasons I was a little more agitated. One, because I had the supersonic record that was a hit and I wasn't getting paid. Two, I was the only one in the group at the time that had my own apartment. So I had bills. Like nobody else had bills. They was living with moms and living with aunts or whatever. I had an apartment. I had a car payment. So I'm like, hey man, I need to get paid around yeah. this motherfucker because I got hits on the radio and I can't get paid. Yeah. So finally I was like, fuck that. I went and got me an attorney. And I remember, because I remember I talked to Dre about it. I talked to Cube about it. I talked to everybody about it. But you know, NWA was blowing up. Everything was gravy. Like 
shows, JJ Fab, but in my mind it wasn't gravy because the little cash that we was getting didn't justify no. the million sales to me. And I think too, I was the only one in the group that was a solo rapper before. Like Cube was with CIA, but I was a solo rapper like me, my own stuff. Right. I did all the business on my stuff. I knew what the royalties were. I knew what the writers and the, the publishers, points, yeah. I knew all of that in my head. And I'm like, man, we getting ripped off. There's like millions of dollars out there and we ain't getting it. So I got me an attorney, went to Jerry, had a meeting and we straightened it out. And then I left the group and I'm like, okay, I got paid and told everybody like, man, you know, I'm, I'm going to do my thing because I got this agreement and then I'm going to go do this. And I remember going to a concert a um, week or two later, I bought a Porsche and I went to the concert and it was like, where the fuck you get that from? I'm like, hey man, you need to go talk to Jerry. And then I think that next week or that day, Cube ended up confronting Jerry because Jerry wanted them to sign contracts in order to get paid. And I'm like, why the fuck you got to sign a contract to get your money? Yeah. yeah. You know, so, uh, yeah. Wow. Uh, I remember when I first met Jerry, I shared it on the past show, was at the Anaheim Celebrity Theater. Yep, I remember that show. Man, I used to love that place. Yeah, man. they still got one in, in um, Arizona. In Arizona, you're yep. right. You're right. I remember when I first saw him, he walked in, tall dude, black trench coat. Yep. You know, and he opened the door, let's go. And I was like, what the fuck? Who in the hell is that? And I remember Steve, uh, 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 he goes, that's Jerry Heller, dude. That's the man right there. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, shit. But it, it, at that time, it almost seemed like everybody was somewhat afraid of him for some reason. Yeah, you know? I don't know why. Yeah. But so you left first and then Cube left. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. So w what did you end up doing after that? You end up getting back into the studio soon after that? I left and then um, I ended up getting a, my own solo deal with um, EMI. Orpheus. Okay. That's where um, MC8 was over. Compass Bill Swan was yes. on there. It was out in New York. Yes. And um, I went, I said, you know what, man? And I'm, I'm always honest, man. I went out there game banging and shit. I told people, I tell you this, man. I say it on, on YouTube, on radio, whatever. I game banged for two days. <laughs> two days I was a game banger. Now, my uncles and cousins, they was the real shit. Like, right. nobody messed with me because my uncles was the James right. boys and over there in that area, like Centennial, they ran that shit. So nobody ever messed with me. Right, right. But one day, eighth grade, I never forget this. You know how they had, uh, not the high school, but remember I told you, we didn't have junior high. Right. But you would still go to whatever they call grad day at Magic Mountain. Right, right. Me and my boys decided we're going to game bang at Magic Mountain. Like, we just wouldn't bought a bunch of khakis. Right. I had that what they called at the time the crypt jacket, the jacket yeah. with the with the letters on the right. back. So we was all just banging it at freaking Magic Mountain. Wasn't nobody to bang too. We was just we was safe, safe banging. <laughs> so we did that that day, and I guess we were filling our royal oats. And the next day, we decided to go to the Hawthorne Mall like that. Oh wow! And like on the way back, some real gang it was some. Uh, I think it was some like. I can't remember who it was. It was some bloods that caught us on the way back to my cousin's house. Right, right. right. And they socked my homeboy, broke his broke his um, nose. And that's the first time I ever seen somebody get their shit, like, right in front of me, like, right. this close. Ha! And I was like, oh, shit. And remember I told you I was a running back, right? Right. That's the last the motherfucker saw me. And that was the end of my game banging career right then. But I wasn't no punk though. Right, like right, in NWA, right. we handled our business, but I wasn't out there banging and shit. So. Yeah, man. Uh, you know, I remember one time when, when you guys were performing at the Anaheim Celebrity Theater, and then uh, dudes were throwing up the Compton jackets, and yeah. they started fighting. Yeah. And I remember Dre stopped the music. It was on the turntables, and he said, "Hey, man, if them motherfuckers want to fight, bring them up on stage." And the fucking crowd went crazy. Yeah. You know, because they, they were fucking up the show. Fucking up the show. Yeah. You know? But th those were some great, great memories for me. Now, you go to this record label. And if I'm correct, uh, you dropped, she's got a big posse. She's got a big posse, and that was a pretty big one, yeah. Okay, let me say this. I still bump that damn song, you know, uh, uh, especially from the very beginning. You do understand she wanted yeah, a big, big posse. posse yeah. That shit is hard, man. The bass, that song to a lot of us Latinos is like a fucking West Coast classic anthem Damn. song for us like we truly truly love that song i love your deep voice i, I always tell my boys I mean, this guy got to open his own, his own radio station just play all dope slow songs and just talk <laughs> hello ladies how you doing you know what I'm saying? you got that dope voice yeah man. but the way you used it on she's got a big posse it's funny because you know uh uh 
you know, we would bump that song and we would always say she's got a big pussy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? But uh, um, that shit was dope. I don't know if you got to see the little trailer that we did promoting your. Yeah, album. I did. Yeah. That shit is hard, bro. And then yeah. your jewelry curl and everything. Yeah. That shit was hard, man. You, you ever think about growing that back? Nah, man. <laughs> if, if it come back, if it come back, right, I'll come back, back, huh? I still got hair under here. <laughs> That'll work. Okay, so now you dropped that was the single, and then the album came out. Yeah, I dropped that single. Then we dropped the album. And the cool thing is, I had done like this really cool, almost independent deal. So I was making a lot more money because I didn't take money to do the tracks. Because oh, you know, you didn't get your, your advance. Yeah, yeah. So I was just trying to get paid. So you know, a lot of people was like, "Oh man, you know." You didn't go gold. I'm like, I don't give a shit. I made three yeah. times as much money as anybody else would normally make on a, you know, an right. album like that. So, and then once I figured that out, I just have always been like a, you know, a student of business, you know, and I started looking at numbers like, why does a record company always get so much money if I'm doing all the work? So, you know, I did that album and then I dropped a, a solo album after that because that album did well, and then I was going to do another one. They actually asked me to go back more hardcore because I went away from hardcore and started doing more party kind of. Right. You know, it was not party electro, but party just, you know, right. banging party. And I was like, well, shit, I could, I could do it. I said, I ain't going to be talking about no game banging shit because that's not what I do. But I'll talk about women and sex and that kind of stuff. Right, so, right. I, you know, I know Prince and all of that. So I started doing, I did this thing called The Underworld. Okay. And then when I delivered it to EMI, they were like, oh, hell no, that's just too crazy. <laughs> like, they wouldn't, they didn't want to put it out. But they gave me the rights back. And I changed it up. And then I ended up doing um, the hose de Bozak, mm -hmm. you know, like, and did it independently and made a lot of money off that. Wow. Wow. And do you still keep records? I mean, like, as far as either vinyl or cassettes or yeah. CDs, any of that stuff? Yeah. Wow, I only have one CD of my record, and I kept it actually because my mother kept it. I had given yeah. it to her in the long CD box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she oh, I don't have. Any, I mean, you know, I wish I had some of that stuff, but I still have like one or two of each, and I wish I'd have known. But you don't know when you're doing right. it. You think oh, I can get them? I can get them. That, that's 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 what that's happens. Real. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna take another uh, two minute break, and then we'll be back for our last thirty minutes. So once again. Uh, call a friend, text a friend, page a friend. The reason why I say page a friend is because I met a guy about three months ago that actually gave me his beeper number and said, you can reach wow. me on my hip. That's exactly what I he need, said. I need that. Yeah. So I, <laughs> I need that. So I was like, okay, cool. And I still actually have my original beeper. But uh, I'm a collector. I try to save everything. But once again, the Rodeo Mixtape documentary, you can get it at documentary.com. And uh, I'm saying it right here in front of Arabian Prince that I put this documentary up against any West Coast documentary right now, okay? Uh, you will not be disappointed. So once again, uh, we'll be back after this commercial break. Let somebody know that Brother A-Rap is in the building. Yes, sir. These right here are the ultimate breaks and beats. These were introduced to the West Coast by Steve Yano. They came from the East Coast to the West Coast and they were sold only at the Rhodium. You can still see the Rhodium sticker there. And these are called, once again, the ultimate breaks and beats. If you're a DJ or a producer, you better know what these are. If not, don't call yourself a DJ or a producer. Me and High C right here, we know about these. Back in the day, I would have doubles of everything. Uh, here's a quick story. When Ice Cube left NWA, he came over to my pad and I was playing some beats for him. 
before he left to New York to do his album, America's Most Wanted, he actually uh, um, asked me if he can borrow a set of my uh, Ultimate Breaks and Beats. I let him borrow it, never saw the dude again, man. I guess that's what he meant by Jacket for Beats. But you know what? <laughs> Much love to Ice Cube. He helped put not only Compton, South Central, but West Coast on the map. So much love to him. But once again, these are the records that Steve introduced to the West Coast. You don't believe me? As Dr. Dre. Hey, what you think of that Tony A. mixtape? Oh, that Tony A. mixtape, the Rodium tape? No, that's back in the day. That's when Cube and them got started. The first time I ever heard of High C. Boy, busting, busting fresh ass rats, freestyle shit. That's back in the days. But right here at my homie Skateboard Shop with Tony A, the mixtape, the Rodeo mixtape. It's a rap. That's that real mixing. It wasn't back in the days like all these, oh, I got these artists right here rapping. It was real mixing, man. Tony A, the Rodeo tape, man. Good looking out for that, man. It got me through a lot of shit. What's up from Ball Heights all the way to Wilmington, baby? We got you, yeah. One love, baby. Yeah. Yo, man, you know what this is? This is 5 0, the original Rodeo mixtape by motherfucking Tony A. the Wizard, G. Check this shit out. That's that heat right there. Word up. Hey. DJ C, DJ the Gap, Ice Cube. What the fuck is Dr. Dre? Yo, Dr. Dre, Tony A. the Wizard mixtapes. Gonna wait to get our hands on that shit. Bump that shit, get the chills on those fucking hot mixtapes. Ain't nothing like it. That's fucking legendary. LA, like a bug. Word, Tony totally A. is on the mix. Woo! What's up, y'all? It's your man, DJ M3, here to talk about the Rhodium mixtape and kind of the pioneer of the mixtape uh, done by my man, Tony A. Uh, I met Tony A several years ago. I mean, listen, I've known of him. I knew who he was. He was a big influence in kind of the way I DJ and the way I constructed my mixtapes um, through a four track or an eight track. Uh, and uh, he was definitely a big influence in that sense. Um, you know, the first time I listened to a, to a Rhodium mixtape, I was just kind of blown away and just so intrigued with the way it was put together, you know, not only from a, you know, from a cutting and a scratching standpoint, but just the way it was constructed and the way it was, um, uh, the way it was uh, kind of organized, um, very precise. Um, you know, the, the cuts and the scratches were, were super, super clean, you know, uh, along with the blending in there. Um, you know, it definitely took it to another level with adding like really, really uh, influential artists uh, that we know today, DJ Quick, NWA, Ice Cube, uh, you know, so it was definitely a, a game changer when it came to mixtapes. And, you know, I don't think we've ever seen in our generation or this new generation of today, I don't think we've ever seen a mixtape quite like the Rhodium mixtape because of the way it was produced, right? And um, a lot of the credit goes to, you know, obviously Steve Yano, but more importantly to, to Tony A because he was the one that pretty much mostly produced, um, you know, those mixtapes with a four track recorder, right? No less, um, you know, when you have a four track, you're kind of limited to, um, you know how many layers you can put on your mix um you know i was fortunate enough to use uh, a four track recorder and also an eight track digital recorder um and obviously the eight track digital recorder was definitely easier because you could layer a lot more sounds but you know for tony to come in and um and do his mixes on a four track and lay those tracks down so cleanly uh, and so seamlessly, it was pretty. It was pretty amazing. So, you know, definitely a big influence on on kind of, um, you know, how I did my mixtapes. Uh, and I definitely, <laughs> I definitely bit a lot of the stuff that that he did. But I, I, I you know, my my mixtapes were were definitely, you know, uh, constructed after Tony's style. And uh, but I don't think anybody did it better than Tony because Tony was just the master at at that. And um, you know. Uh, listening to, to all of the Rhodium mixtapes, you know, kind of growing up while I was DJing, you know, had, uh, you know, had a big impact on, on the way that I did my mixes and, and things like that and music selection and, and things like that. So it was definitely a, a game changer for, uh, for me in terms of, you know, taking my DJ 
game to the next level. Um, obviously, I'm retired now, but uh, you know, definitely can appreciate, you know, kind of the history behind the mixtape, right? And I think I, I, I would it would be safe to say that this is probably the original mixtape because now mixtapes are more of you know a hype man behind it with maybe a beat and then you know all kinds of rappers but there really wasn't the creativity when it came to putting together a mixtape you know layering sounds layering beats different scratches adding different scratches telling a story with with uh with the chops that you did with your cuts transitioning into the next song that was a big that was a big thing back then um, and you needed to be skillful to be able to do that. And uh, Tony was de definitely perfected that art and uh, he took it to another level. So uh, Tony A, we salute you. Um, and uh, you know, congratulations on this documentary. Definitely um, something that was needed to kind of tell the story of what it was like back in the day and um, kind of where we get our roots in terms of mixing um, and and mixtapes right but uh, definitely uh, the mixtapes of, of those days uh, of the rhodium days definitely is steps and notches above what the mixtapes are of today so I just think that mixtapes today are, are, are extremely boring that's why I never I'll take a listen but they're definitely not as intriguing as um, as Tony's uh, rhodium mixtapes so yeah i mean you know it, it was definitely a um a game changer for for me when it came to djing but um you know uh shout out to my man dg um uh, he was actually the one that introduced me to tony you know years and years ago um and uh you know blessed to know him uh tony shout out uh you did your thing my man and uh actually I think you should come out with another mixtape, man. I mean, what's stopping you? You know, you obviously, I'm pretty sure you still got the skills on the on the turntables and the fader. So let's let's get it let's get it started again, man. I I'd love to see another rhodium mixtape, and yo, I would love to collaborate on you uh, with you on that too. So you know, if you if you uh, if you want to do that, I'd be more than happy to you know kind of kind of join in in, in the mix, right? So. Um, but uh, yeah, congratulations again. Um, shout out Rhodium Mixtapes, RIP Steve Yano. Um, shout out to my man DG. And, um, you know, salute Tony A. And uh, I'm out. Peace. Go ahead, Tom. Yo, welcome everybody back to Rhodium Radio. Uh, we're going to jump right into it because there's a lot to cover. Um, Brother Arab, thank you once again for coming. Uh, it's truly been an honor and a pleasure to be able to sit across from you and talk to you about these old stories and you dropping these gems on us about not only the turntables, mixers, the drum machines, but also stories from audio achievements to JJ Bad to uh, working on your solo projects. So now you you had dropped, you got a big posse, you dropped another album. Yep. Then you, uh, if I'm correct, you went back and did the second JJ Fad album? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they brought me back in for the second album. Okay. Um, to co-produce that, me and Yella did that one. What I think it was a couple other people involved as well, and then went back and just did that. Um, now, now, when you say they brought you back, who who would they, they be? Was it, was it still Jerry? Jerry and Dre and everybody, because Dre didn't want to do it. Dre didn't have time to do it. Okay. So they were like, "Well, you know, you had the first hit. Would it come back and do it? Did my deal? Deal was cool. So I went back and worked on the next project. Okay. And did yeah. you guys do that at Audio Achievements? Yeah, as well? we did it at Audio Achievements as well. Now, now let me ask you this, uh, uh, because there were stories floating around that so many artists were, I, I knew Dre was swamped. Yeah. Uh, um, there were so many artists that were asking Dre for music and he had to end up turning them down. Uh, uh, were you ever there uh, to clarify if that was true or who were some of these artists? For an example, I had heard EPMD, I had heard Public Enemy, I I had even heard as far as Madonna and even Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. I don't, uh, can you clarify any of those? Well, I don't know about Madonna or Michael Jackson. You know, back okay. then, no, I don't think so. But I know there were a lot of people asking, you know, because you remember even later on, I mean, we had uh, uh, Black Eyed Peas was on Ruthless for a minute. Yeah. You know, so um, there was a lot of people wanting 
tracks and stuff, but he was he was too busy to do it. Yeah. You know, that's all it was. I think he was more focused on always was always NWA first. It was always, you know, NWA easy or the staple you know, like Michelle A, because yeah. they got hot and started popping off, and then HWA, and you know, it was like, yeah, <laughs> right, yeah, right. okay, okay, good. Because I remember Steve shared with me those stories, and I saw Dre, and I don't even know if he was even sure what what I was even asking him, but I know I had brought up Michael Jackson, and he just said, he answered it like this: I just can't really work with anybody when I'm just too busy yeah. you know and I was like okay cool because I remember he had told me that he could he wouldn't be able to rap on those mixtapes anymore right. I understood that yeah, yeah that came first you know but uh, um I'll tell you what though having Cube, Dre, Jinx, uh, Easy rapping on my mixtapes really brought my name up on the street yeah. you know what I'm saying I remember uh doing my first mixtape it was uh uh, we had JJ Fad, um I want to say it was 1987 because it was on the Dream Team uh, Orange Label, yep. Supersonic. And that was the first, uh, I think it was called Breakdown. We named it, that mixtape, after one of the songs of Unknown. He did a song called yeah, yeah. Breakdown. Yeah. Yeah. So we named that cassette Breakdown, and J.J. Fad was our first song. Uh, I, I actually shared it in a documentary that uh, um, when I heard it, I thought that was song was the shit. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And everybody loved it. You know, I remember back then, uh, uh, remember that song? Um, I'm trying to remember the name of that group, but they, they had a song called Sally, that girl. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I just bumped it the other day. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would be mixing all those songs together, you know what I'm saying? So that's the kind of music we had on those mixtapes. So, but when I did that mixtape on a four track, I remember Steve tells me, by this time next year, he said, your name's going to be known, Tony. Yeah. And I'll be honest with you. I was a nickel and diming, you know, drug dealer, you know, and I was like, really? And in my mind, I'm thinking, I just want my $200 so I can go buy some more yeah, drugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty much what I was thinking, you know, but it was true. It was true. My, my name did get out there. And that's why I decided to put this together, Yeah. you know, because uh, Steve literally changed my life since uh, 40 years ago when he gave me my first job uh, at 11 years old. Yeah. You know, so now, um, how, how did that did that JJ Fad second album do? Were you happy with it? Nah, I wasn't happy with it because there was a lot of other people involved, and I had said honestly, all we need to do is make about ten more Supersonics in different ways. Yes, all banging eight hundred eight beats, and we done. Yeah, but you know, it was people who had other visions and other ideas. It was cool. It did. I okay. You know, did they so. ever come up with a third one? No. No, no, I never came up with a third one because wow. you know, remember everybody broke up and left. Easy passed away. It was so many things that it yeah. went down. So, yeah, yeah. You, you know, speaking about Easy passing away, uh, how did you first hear about him being sick? Was it when it hit the news? Did you already know? Were people already talking? So I, you know, because I, I was still, I ain't never had beef with nobody, like right. except for Jerry Heller at the time. You know, I was still cool with everybody. So when like. Fuck y'all, cause no, it wouldn't. I, I'm a. I always say I, I'm a grown ass man. I got my big boy pants on. I yes. take care of my own shit, so I took care of my business. I'm still cool with y'all, but I got a problem with Jerry Heller over here. And I used to still hang out with everybody. We played paintball together. We would just you know hang out, and it was. I think it was DJ Yella's birthday party in the Valley, and Easy was there. He looked fine to me. This was like literally a week before he had. Um, if I can remember correctly, like soon after, like very soon after he went to the hospital and died like really, really quick. So wow. no one knew he was sick, you know, and yeah. And I, I know another story. I'm not going to tell it, but I know something from Donovan. You have to ask Donovan yourself. Right. I'll let, you know, him tell it to you. And, um, and he knows something that nobody knows because he was there. That's right. all I can say. Right. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. And, uh, um, I'll say that one for another show. Yeah, you yeah. Know. You know, it's funny, man, because uh, I know Donovan, uh, I used to ask him a lot of questions because I was just like this kid, like, what, what was, what's that for? Because I had never been on a big-ass board. Yeah, 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 The biggest board that I ever had, I went from the Tascam Portal 1 yeah. to, to the uh, the bigger uh, Real to Real, right. you know, 8-track, you know, and um, to see a big-ass board, and then he was one of the first guys that I ever knew that had an actual computer. Yeah. You know, I actually still have a picture of me sitting at his board. Yeah. You know, but uh, I have pictures of Donovan, and I have pictures of Mike Sims. Yeah. Uh, um, Mike. So Mike played on all my stuff. Like even really? my later albums, Mike Sims was my boy. He actually played the guitar, and 
actually did a lot of vocal stuff for me. Yeah. You, you know, it's funny because Steve Yano gave me, he videotaped our whole sessions at Audio Achievements, okay? Uh, Steve Yano, rest in peace. And one day he gives me on a VHS the whole session of high C rapping and me doing the scratch and the song, Donovan Engineering, Mike Sims playing the bass. And then Julio Cesar Chavez is fighting that Saturday. So I didn't have a videotape to a videotape. So I said, oh, Steve will give it to me again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I put that videotape, press record, Chavez yeah. was fighting somebody. And uh, I never got that back. Steve wow. passed away. Uh, Susan back and forth, his wife to San Francisco. And she's like, Tony, I don't know where that stuff is at. Yeah. You know, I wish I could have put that in the documentary. Oh, yeah. You know, but uh, I still have uh, two or three good pictures of Donovan and uh, Mike Sims. I, I mean, I haven't seen Donovan in years, and I wish I, I can see him at the NAM. I, I think he usually goes there. Yeah. You know, but uh, yeah, Donovan was, was uh, uh, I have great memories with him as well. Now, when did you find out that they were going to be doing a straight out of Compton movie? Uh, I think one of my homeboys told me about it. Um, so nobody actually called you, said, "Hey, uh, brother Arab." No, 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 motherfucker, don't call me. <laughs> yeah, man. Somebody told me, "Hey, you ain't doing any great movie." I'm like, "What? Really? All right, cool. All right, we'll see what happens." Wow. You know? oh, okay. Well, like, so they started filming it. At that time, did anybody contact you? Still? Nah, I ain't nobody. Con not even to this day, nobody contacted me. Wow. You know? Okay. Um, did they put you in the movie? Uh so, so I was, so this is when I found out, like, well, I don't even know if they're going to put me in the movie. And I remember there was months where they were going through, like, who should play who. Right. And they kept popping people up on who should play me and who should play Yella and who should play this. Then finally they had cast it and I saw, like, there was some dude playing me. You know, all right, cool. All right. And then I said, well, I guess I'm in the movie, but ain't nobody invited me to the set. Nobody invited me to the premiere or none of this. I'm like, all right, cool, whatever. I'm good. Um, and then, uh, the movie comes out, right? And they say, all right, you ain't even in the movie. And it was kind of weird because the first poster didn't even have Ren and Yella in it. Remember it was like, just, it was like easy cube and Dre. Dre. Wow. And then Ren kind of got upset about it. And then they went and redid it and made it with all of them, you know, and, I wasn't in it, you know. No, like I said, whatever. But um, so, but they actually filmed you. As yeah, because somebody was. I had people that was on set that would send me pictures, like of my character there. Like there's a scene from the back of one of the records where we're all sitting on a jeep, that famous jeep shot. Yes, they reenacted that. They reenacted the Straight Outta Compton album cover as well with the kit with the actors. And then somebody sent me and says, oh, that's you right there. I'm like, I didn't know who was me anyway, because I never said, they never said that that's my name. But I guess, I guess at the roller skating rink, that's me standing there behind mm. everybody, like just standing there. Right, right. So I'm like, that's cool. Wow. And you didn't even go to, go to the premiere? Nah. So, okay. I'm just going to, I'm going to hit you with this question. So not Dre, not Cube. And not yell and not rent. Nobody called you. Say, hey man, premieres tonight. Nah, nah. Like I said, I'm still cool with everybody. I don't right. give a fuck. It's just like people gonna be who they are. They gonna right. do what they do. I don't question why, cause I just do me. You, you know, know, it was funny because I knew a bunch of guys that I, I don't want to say their names, but I'm not. That's fucked up. They didn't even put me in the movie. A bunch of yeah, guys, yeah. and I, and I remember I had talked to you, and you said, yeah, they, they, they you know, they cut me out, and I'm yeah. like, okay, I know you were, yeah, yeah. you know. But these other guys are like they were just yeah. You know, I was actually more upset that they didn't mention or show JJ Fad because I knew the monetary contribution of Supersonic. Like yes. even though I did Supersonic, as as motherfuckers get to know me, they know I don't care. I don't care about the fame. I just like to create, man. I'm a producer. Right. I'm a futurist. I just like to create stuff. Yes. And I'm cool. I'm cool. As long as I'm getting paid, I'm cool. Right. So for me, it's business. Okay. Business is business. That up, all that other shit. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Now, uh, I take it that you saw the movie. Yeah. What was your opinion about it? Amazing film. So amazing film, maybe accuracy. Yeah. 20, 30 percent, in my opinion. 20, 30 percent. I remember I asked uh, uh, Lonzo. Yeah. On a scale of one to ten, on accuracy, yeah. where is it at? He said a seven. Okay, I, I say about a, a three. 
Okay. Because it seems in my what I'm saying it on a lot of things were embellished. Yes. You know, a lot of some things happened, but there was some stuff with like, you know, ain't no way in hell we could have guns like that. <laughs> you could you can go to the airport without the. I mean, I I bet I was there when we got off a plane, dude, and it was like it looked like the the freaking um movie uh the blues brothers movie yeah like the whole freaking terminal like police like what up you know so yeah yeah there's a lot of embellished stuff in there and i still say this to the day i don't i wasn't there right i know easy i met suge suge knew my uncles and cousins right but i met suge a couple times or whatever i, I knew him but i didn't know him like whatever but i don't I don't see nobody whooping Easy's ass like that, and ain't no retaliation happening. Easy wasn't that dude. I know. So in the movie, yeah. him getting beat up like that, I was like, when when that shit happened? Like I don't remember that. Right. Right. Because I mean that there would have been a whole lot of body bags somewhere. Yeah. That's yeah. who he was. You know, it's funny because you said it was an amazing film, and I have to agree with you because when I watched it with my kids, well, my older son, and um, I totally forgot. Cause I thought it was so dope that it was an NWA movie. I felt like I was watching a, a hood eighties movie. Yeah. That's how I enjoyed it. I almost had to remind myself, this is NWA right here. You yeah, know? yeah. You know, but, um, I remember this. Okay. Susan told me this, Steve Yano's wife. Yeah. She said that Dre had called them and said, we're going to put you guys in the movie. There's going to be a scene where I go to the swamp meet, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Steve was still alive, obviously at the time. And, you know, he wasn't expecting much, so yeah. it didn't make it. So, Dre calls Susan again and tells her, we're doing my documentary. I need all that footage that Steve uh, uh, filmed of us at Audio Achievements. Yeah. Uh, so, they brought it. Yeah. Okay. They're not done with the documentary. They're still editing and everything. Steve passes away. Yeah. Okay. Um. Dre calls uh, Susan and says, "Don't worry, we're gonna put it. We're gonna put it in. Um, I'm gonna honor him. You know that type of yeah. deal." Well, the documentary came out. No, nothing. Nothing. You know, yeah. and it's cool. You know, whatever. Yeah. whatever. Uh, the only thing that bothered me about what Dre didn't do was this: that when Steve passed away, Susan had asked me to speak at his funeral. Yeah. So I spoke. Uh, I would have been happy with just him showing up. Showing up, yeah. You know, I don't think he owes anybody anything, but I just think that because uh, the, the message was that he brought, you know, they brought some flowers and uh, he was busy, he was doing something. But let me tell you something, brother. I don't think you could ever be too busy to bury a friend. Yeah. So I'll yeah. leave that there, but that's pretty much my story. But I, I, I enjoyed the movie. Um, so now, what, what can we expect from you? Are you still working on music right now? So I, you know, I DJ all over the world. I tour, yes. you know, everywhere. I still Professor X, still Arabian Prince stuff. Um, I do a lot of EDM stuff now, dance music. Really? But not like, I don't actually do that music. Right. But they bring me and let me play at those festivals because I rock old school electro and all the other stuff that goes along with that. So it's not a whole night of just... <laughs> Right, you know what right, I mean. Right, Bring that right. little something, something to it. So I do that, and I'm actually working on a new album in that kind of genre. Some other thing. I'm just kind of that's big money there. Yeah, because I'm. I mean, I'm a producer. I can produce anything. So I yes. just kind of do that. I'm still touring. Matter of fact, JJ Fat. You just saw JJ yeah. Fat the other day. We yes. still do shows together. Um, yeah, man. But you know, more my my focus now more is technology and social good. That's where my brain is at right okay. now. Okay. So when you say technology, is there something that you're inventing, you're coming up with, you're sharing ideas with different companies? Uh, uh you know, can you share a little bit about so that? So I'm I'm a consultant for a lot of companies, and what a lot of people don't know about me is I've been doing technology for like 37 years because when I was young. When I talked about my, my cousin who had the synthesizer, they were the ones bringing all that tech home from overseas, and I was soaking it in. And then when I got my first royalty check off my record, I bought a computer, and I became that dude in L.A. who was like the studio tech dude. When anybody needed some sequence, they call me up. Oh, right. how you hook this up? I come over, hook up everybody's MIDI. I knew how to <laughs> sync, you know, MIDI to CV gate and to Simpty. I was that dude. Yes. And yes. then I was on the side teaching myself how to code because I wanted to write 
my own software because yes. I didn't like the music software was out, software that was out there. So I started doing that, and then I started messing around with animation, and ended up starting an animation company. I did like the first series of the Power Rangers. I did Casper, Silver Surfer, Adams Family, a lot of motion pictures, and then I got into video games and started making video games with Fox Interactive, Vivendi Universal, and now I own esport companies and. I just launched a new um, piece of tech that I designed called M Classic. It's the first ever graphics card for game consoles. So you plug oh. this into any game console, it'll up-res the graphics to 4K wow. in real time. So yeah. Okay, now let me ask you this, because I have to ask you for us gamers. Are you an Xbox guy or a Sony PlayStation guy? So I'm a... So there's a third part of that. I'm a PC guy first. Okay. Because I play... I got though I build crazy gaming PCs. Matter of fact, one of my partner companies, EVGA. Shout out to EVGA. So for all you gamers out there, I know there's a whole lot of freaking gamers out there. Y'all know who EVGA is. They make like the, the graphics cards and the motherboards. We do something quarterly for St. Jude's Hospital to raise money for kids, and yes. we did this live stream. Man, they they built me a SpongeBob computer, like wow, straight out like full SpongeBob computer. Because I love Spongebob. Yes. So they hooked me up with that. Wow. Yeah. So that That's was kind of dope. dope. So, Xbox? Yeah. So, okay. So, <laughs> I'm Xbox. I'm an Xbox guy first. Okay. Because Microsoft's one of my partners. So, maybe I'm a little biased. But I was Xbox before Microsoft okay. was my partner. Yeah. I'm a PlayStation guy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's funny because growing up, everything was Atari, Super Nintendo, Nintendo 64. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all that stuff. I've always been a gamer. Uh, now it's just PlayStation and I only play one game and I'm really good at it. Madden. Madden. I'm a Madden guy too. I'm a Madden guy. Yeah. Bro. My cousin is actually a Madden champion. Really? Yeah. He he was on the Marine. They had the, the TV show. He was on the bus. They had that bus. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. My cousin, they call him your mama. So when you get, when he beats you, he said, you got beat by your mama. mama. That's just dope. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny because right here on the side of my house, uh, I would set up four TVs. We had a four PlayStations, and I would people would come. Uh, sometimes it'd be twenty five bucks a pot, uh, fifty bucks a pot, but it would be about eight hundred bucks. And yeah. the winner would. would uh, but I had tournaments. I love I love Madden. Uh, uh, I used to play all kinds of games before, but I wanted to get good at one, and I love football, so that's what I played. Maybe one day I'll buy me an Xbox, and we can go heads up. Yeah, let's do it. You know, but, you know the thing is, the, like I said, I think the real reason why I got an Xbox because I they call me Professor X. So I, when I saw the box with the X, I'm like, right. I got that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. But I still got both, you know. Okay. So now, uh, really quick, um, you're going to be at the NAM, correct? Yeah, I'll be at NAM. Okay, you'll be at NAM. Uh, you'll be performing anywhere anytime soon Dude, uh, with JJ I, Fad or DJing? Uh, or we got can some see more you? stuff coming up, but I'm DJing all the time, man, in LA. Like, okay. all the time in LA. Um, and I might be doing, I'm always doing something at NAM, too. So I'm always doing something with NAM and one of the parties. Or whatever, yeah. So we okay. got got some things that I'm going over to Europe. I got some stuff in Europe and France. I got to do because me and the Egyptian lover, we still do a lot of stuff overseas. So you, you know, one thing I like I like I like about the Egyptian lover because he still be doing that King Touch. Oh, he, hey, he be he be getting it. That shit is know. dope. Man. That shit is yeah. dope. So a dream come true was it or is to have him here. I got you. I'll make that happen. Thank you, man. Thank yeah. you. And I, I want him to breathe for me. You know what I'm saying? Hey, I'll do I'll do you one better. I'll make him come here and I can almost guarantee you he'll bring the 808. Oh my And y'all can go 808 live on, on camera. You know what? Okay, speaking of 808, I saw something in audio achievements in the 80s that I couldn't believe was possible. Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong. I saw an 808 there that had MIDI in on it. Yeah, so most of the new ones, people buy them and you could put a MIDI kit on it. And you, you can MIDI it to something, you know. No, no, but I'm talking about back then. I yeah, saw yeah, you could do it back then. That's when we started doing it. Really? One of our friends back then, who we still know to this day, is named Daniel Sofer. And if anybody looks up Daniel Sofer, he was like Oberheim, like back when Oberheim, Oberheim was course. big. He was the one when we had our DMX and our DX drum machines. You couldn't change the sounds in them. It was an EPROM. It was like a chip. <laughs> and he would burn the sounds on chips and bring them to us. Wow. So he started doing that. And then he was saying, well, you can mod other stuff. And then he told us about this company that would mod 808s, that you would just put this little module in it, and it would make it, you know, um, MIDI. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, I have a lot of uh, 
dope memories or audio achievements. And many times when I go either like a Pia or I go by old torrents, I get saddened because the whole era is gone. Music has changed. And, uh, but you know, before we leave the audio achievement story, I wanted to ask you something, um, as a friend, leaving NWA and seeing how they blew up. Yeah. Do you ever regret leaving? No, nah, because I was on Straight Outta Compton. What was after that? Yeah. I mean, as far as big. No, you're, you're right. Right. You're right. I was on Straight yeah. Outta Compton and I left. And like I said, for me, it wasn't about fame. It was about money. It was about business. And people said, man, you know, how could you, how could you leave, you know, when all this was happening? I'm like, well, how could you stay if you wasn't getting paid? If you wasn't getting And eventually paid. when people figured it out, everybody left. It wasn't like they knew they was getting ripped off and getting punked and stayed once they finally took it right. on their own time to figure right. it out because everybody expects everybody to be a business person straight off. But, you know, some people have to believe it and figure it out on their own terms. Right. But, yeah, that's all it's you about. You know, it's funny because uh, I want to say 1997, I was working on Mellow Man Asia's, uh album that n was never released. As a matter of fact, when I interviewed Mellow on here, I think it was my, actually episode one, we played a lot of those songs that we did in the 90s that never came out. One of them was actually with Tina Marie. Mm. And uh, Jerry was managing us, you know. I'll be honest with you, and may you rest in peace, I didn't really want him to. Yeah. I'd rather have Violet Brown. Oh, yeah, Violet. Yeah, I love Violet, man. Yes, as a day. matter of fact, Violet speaks very, very highly of you. Uh, all the time, you yeah. know, and, and um, so Mello was like, you know, I think Jerry can, he's putting together a, a record label called Estilo Records and we're going to be going out of Universal or Univision, something yeah. like that. But I was still a little skeptical, you know. So one day we had dinner with him and I asked him, you know, I didn't care. I said, Jerry, man, uh, how do you answer that when people say you ripped off NWA? Yeah, yeah. You know, and here's what he said. And it's so funny that they put that in the movie. He said, if I really ripped them off, why haven't I never been sued before? I didn't know how to come back. Again. Yeah, I walked in there with my attorney. <laughs> Show did okay. more than once. Wow. So. Oh, yeah, well, that's, that's exactly what he said. So, you know, but now, um, do, do you still keep in contact with any of those guys? Yeah, I still talk to everybody. Yeah. Know, I don't talk to Dre as much. Like every now and then, either I'll talk to him or somebody will like, uh -huh. hey, here, hold on. What's up? Oh, what's up, fool? You know, like blah, blah, blah. Yella, me and Yella keep in contact the most. Okay. And then I talk to Ren, you know, okay. all the time. Like, I, I talk to Ren maybe three, four times a year. We was in the same fantasy football league together. But, uh, yeah. And you, Cube, Cube just moved into my neighborhood, but I haven't seen him over there. But I always hear, oh, Cube was just over here. You know, something right, like that. Right, right. Yeah. You know, it's funny that's, that you bring up Yella because um, I was trying to get Yella on the Rodeo Mixtape documentary and uh, through a mutual friend and because uh, I didn't have a number on him. Yeah. So my friend talked to him and he said, yes. OK, then it was I got cock blocked by some dude that was I guess he must have heard that we were doing this, yeah. this documentary. So he started to do his own mm. and he hit up Yella and told him. Hey, I'm Steve Yano's son. Uh, That's what he said. Yeah. So when we hit him up for a date, he said, okay, who who am I doing it for? Because his son came and asked me. Yeah. And uh, I told my friend, dude, let me talk to him. Tell him Steve doesn't have no fucking son. Bro. Yeah. He has two daughters. Yeah. You know, then I found out who it was and it was some, some Korean cat. I'm not going to mention his fucking name. Yeah, yeah. That dude really fucking pissed me off because he cock blocked Yella from being on here. Right. So Yella was like, you know what, man? I'm not even going to do it. I'm a little confused. Yeah. He said he's Steve Yano's son. You said you're doing it for Steve Yano. So I'm just going to kind of stay out of it. Right. I understood it. Ain't no bad blood there. But I wish I could have caught up with that motherfucker and I could have fucked his ass up because <laughs> he, he really pissed me off because this thing right here, brother, it meant the world to me. Yeah. You know, and I don't want to make a part two or whatever, but um, I really wanted Yella, you know, to be a part of it. And if I can get him on here, you know, uh, I, I would love that because I don't have a number on Yella, but I would love to I definitely just call him. me. I would have got him over here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah for, we'll, if you do anything else, we'll get him in there. Yeah, most definitely. I hope he can give us a Wednesday uh, so I could uh, actually interview him and talk to him about yeah. how he met Steve or whatnot. So now let me ask you this. Uh, and in closing, um, do you believe that 
it was important to tell Steve Yano's story. Uh, oh, hell yeah, dude. Like, you know, for the people that don't know about the rhodium, and I actually was there maybe a month ago. You know, I was going somewhere else, and I was like, damn. Let me walk up through this second winter. I just walk through, bought some t-shirts or something. But that's where we was at. Yes. Like, where did you go? You went to the swap meet yes. to get your music. You went to the swap meet to get your clothes. Yes. You went to, I, matter of fact, I went to the swap meet to get my speakers for my car. <laughs> you know, that's you was I was at the rhodium like three, four days a week. It was either the rhodium swap meet or the Compton swap meet. Yes. And Steve is who got us out there, man, with yeah. the mixtapes and selling records and, you know, whatever, dude. So yeah, it's very important because one thing I always say is this. The East Coast history yes. is told very well by a lot of people. The West Coast history, man, is not told that well because I think it's because L.A. is so big and everybody's so spread out. You know, East Coast is like this. Yes. And we got to get the story out, man, because we ain't going to be here that much longer. No, and these young no. cats coming up, they don't know the history. No, they don't know the history. And if we never tell them or share it with them, you know what? Don't think it possibly started with them. Yeah. You know, uh, however it may be. Uh, somebody asked me a question and uh, I want to address it. He said, do you believe, are you saying that hip hop started at West Coast hip hop started at the Rodium? And I said, no. Uh, absolutely not. But what I am saying is that the Rodin Swami through Steviano was a major contribution, a major cornerstone in West Coast hip hop. That's all I'm saying, that he was just a major contributor uh, to it. And, um, you know, just like VIP Records. Yeah, uh, just Captain like Anderson, VIP and Long Beach. Yeah. Um, uh, Cletus Anderson, etc. Yeah. You know, uh, they, they were a major contributor. And these stories must be told because when we're long gone, you know, who's going to tell the story? Yeah. So it was important. That's why I thought it was important to document it so that his name would no longer get lost in West Coast hip hop history. So, yeah, definitely. But anyways, in closing now, any shout outs you want to give or anything you want to say to anyone out there? No, I just want to shout out everybody who listens, man, and, and continue to listen to this podcast because it's crazy the information i've been watching it and you guys give a lot of information man and and we got to get it out there man yes, keep sir. getting the people on here and i also want to give a shout out to wiener schnitzel i will be going to wiener schnitzel as soon as i leave here because it's right down the street thank you very much sir gotta give me some chili dogs man i'm loving them damn chili dogs hell yeah hell yeah as a matter of fact the first the wiener schnitzel was here in the city of wilmington that's where he's and that's where i'm going to that one right here and also too so you know to let all y'all know who just listened to me talk you know Y'all see who I am. That's who I am. This is, I say whatever I say. I ain't trying to be bigger or smaller than I am. I did what I did. Yes, it's just part of that history. But I'm going to continue to create and continue to make new yes, stuff sir. going forward. So Yes, sir. Most definitely. One day, uh, we're going to go live on YouTube. Me and him, we're going to play uh, Madden on Xbox. So what, what, what team do you play with anyway? <sighs> man, the Raiders, man. He's he a Raiders guy. He's a Raiders guy. I'm a... I'm not even going to say it. There it is. <laughs> or, or I go to my homeboy. He's hot right now. My homeboy. Uh, my Ravens? Guy. No, not the Ravens, man. Seattle. My boy, Seattle, homeboy, uh, Russ. Russell. Yeah. Russell Wilson. Yeah, he's fucking dope. Danger bro. Russ. He's fucking Danger dope. Russ Wilson. Okay, everybody. Uh, once again, thank you for tuning in. Brother Arab, my brother right here, the Arabian Prince. Uh, if There was a lot of questions that I didn't get to. We'll, oh. We'll go ahead. Dude, favorite cereal. Boom. Um, uh, I would have to say Cocoa Pebbles because he's baked in milk chocolate. Yes. Yeah, so mine, that's for that homeboy. Mine was Pops. That. Pops, yeah. Pops. I like them, but yes. they kind of hurt, you, hurt your gums. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I don't eat Captain Crunch. Yeah. So, once again, let me give a shout out to John motherfucking Elkins, the guy who makes all this possible. Uh, you know, I'm the running back and he's the offensive line. He's the one that makes all the holes for me. You know what I'm saying? So John motherfucking Elkins, you can reach him at JE visuals uh, on, on Instagram and uh, my boy, Daniel Jones, yes, DJ sir. media clips uh, for taking all the dope pictures for filming this documentary. Uh, Roger Mara, Roger live boomer boomer did the remedy yard. Uh, uh, Kerry Fujita, uh, South Bay Drones. Also, I'd like to thank my son, uh, B. Scanless Brian, for helping me promote, promote this. And if I forgot anybody, please forgive me. But once again, all Rodeo Mixtape Apparel is free shipping, and you can get all your apparel at documentary.com. Order the, docu the documentary. Um, you will not be disappointed, okay? Uh, tomorrow, I will post up who I will have here 
on Sunday. And believe me, you're not going to want to miss Sunday. It's a surprise. So once again, much love, much respect. Anything else, brother? You know what? I thought about something. And if you want to sell your home, holla at your boy because I'm about to go into real estate business. We buying homes. So holla at your boy. We got you. And we out, my brother. Peace. Thank you, man.